I am Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen. Join me as I skip through the history, culture and alchemy of interior design. This will be particularly interesting to any one of you who has something at home that you would consider to be mid-century modern. In this world's hysterical scramble to find safe taste, taste that doesn't blow up in your face, frighten the horses or cause unnecessary overexcitement, I think the comforting anemia of 20th century suburban style has become the, well, the baked beans on toast of 21st century decorating. So-called mid-century modern is as comforting as chicken soup and just as greyish. And for me, it comes with a sort of overwhelming, fuggy nostalgia we also get from an accidental sniff of our long-dead granny's brand of face powder. Familiarity breeding contempt. But where does this pallid style with its splayed legs and avocado-hued tweed actually come from? And why are we still so convinced it's so us? so modern, despite the fact it's, well, late into its 70s. So it all comes from Scandinavia and it starts as a real lifestyle quake just after the Second World War. Remember that, it's significant. For a world desperate to rebuild itself in 60 shades of optimism, the Scandinavian countries with their yogurty, outdoorsy, hand-knitted heartiness did a very job at selling a look that oozed a smiley, fresh start, and it was incredibly appealing. It was the blonde leading the bland. Actually, post-war Scandi chic was really 1930s Germanic modernism, given a new veneer in here reincarnation. Designers of the Smash It Up and Start Again art school movement Bauhaus under head innovator Walter Gropius, had already stripped all the frills off furniture before they were zealously suppressed by the Nazis and the Nazi-preferred neo-Teutonic taste in comfort. But after the Nazi taint had been scraped off the face of Europe, the simplicity and down-to-earthiness of the way life was lived in Sweden and its Nordic neighbours felt like a much better way of doing it. In fact, the Swedes kind of invented design and lifestyle. Artist designer Carl Larsson and his lovely wife Karen had published a book in 1899 called Et Ham at Home, in which ravishingly precious illustrations by Carl showed the cherubic Larsson clan at play in a late arts and crafts bucolic Eden. It was a fabulous bit of self-publicity, hello, in a leather-tooled hardcover. Showing customers how to live with style was a lesson the new generation of Scandi dinosaurs learned from Larson, actively. Ensuring that as far as their end users were concerned, every stick of furniture came with a whiff of pine forest and a lungful of airy fresh air. In Britain and the wispy remnants of its colonies, this new blonder-than-blonde, whiter-than-white style tsunami had antidote written all over it, the antithesis to the dark-stained and chintz-frilled, fussy revival styles that had dominated mass design through the 1930s. Scandi's obvious international appeal allowed it to hit the road and go on the stadium tour circuit. The great Scandinavian design exhibition made a point of visiting all the powerful but still battle-fatigued allied states that had vanquished the Nazi threat, sucking their middle classes into a vortex of out with the old and in with the new. Scandi style really was the new birchy broom that swept cleaner than clean. 
But there was a dark secret concealed in the flat pack Scandi wardrobe that the exhibition so very successfully managed to obfuscate. Some of the star players in this new forward-looking aesthetic movement had a really quite dodgy past. Churchill himself had been vociferously disapproving of Sweden's neutral status during the war and had been violently opposed to the fact they'd blithely continued to supply Nazi Germany and its allies with both natural and mineral resources. Worse still, Finland, desperate to protect itself from its next-door neighbour, Soviet Russia, had actually been a Nazi ally, whilst the Danes were seamlessly occupied by the Reich, allowing Danish life to carry on rather comfortably. Well, for the first few years at least. To what extent Scandinavia actually slept with the enemy is still hotly debated, but one thing was for sure. Distracting public opinion with a nicely turned splay leg or a sinuous bentwood rocking chair very much helped buried the something rotten in the state of Denmark PR story under piles of glossy lifestyle magazine photo shoots. The truth will out, however, and the press feeding frenzy that thrashed around IKEA founder Ingvar Kamprad when it became clear he'd been a particularly enthusiastic member of the Swedish Fascist Party, a jolly group of woodland folk who took direct orders from the Nazis in Germany, shows how the Scandi style we hold so dear had been used to literally, and I believe deliberately, <laughs> paper over some mighty cracks. <laughs> Let's forget for a moment that this fresh new modern design movement had actually grown with its roots in distinctly off-colour political soil. For a world wanting to rebuild itself by rebranding, modern became decorating catnip for the suburban masses, and no one made modern like the Scandinavians. Something I do enjoy is what happens to mid-century modern Scandi style tropes as they skip from nation to nation. In Denmark, the only Scandinavian country with an historical trading relationship with the Orient, Arnie Jakobsen used darker stained timber and there's a light Asian inspiration in a lot of his shapes that make his pieces much more exotic feeling. Whilst in Finland, a Slavic love of folksy pattern making found its way via modern materials into the work of Paavo Tinel and a kindergarten colour palette made Mary Mecco an explosion of finger-painted fun. In the Americas, Charles and Ray Eames, Aero Saarinen and Oscar Niemeyer brought the style to fruition as the perfect backdrop to cocktail-sodden mad men living. It became the go-to Midwest motel style, although America also embraced the contemporaneous delights of Hollywood Regency, something we'll be thoroughly enjoying at another time, I do assure you. In the UK, I remember all too well the really rather drudgy, Janelle-approved, soft socialist, suburban iteration of, of Scandi's style as peddled by Robin and Lucian Day. Actually, Britain did Scandi modern quite well, the lengthy and still active influence of William Morris's arts and crafts brought a, a woody blokiness to Scandi. It became the dominant aesthetic for all of our particularly British institutionalised institutions like the BBC, the Festival of Britain, the John Lewis Partnership and the NHS. And I suppose that's exactly where the issue lies. There's something the state sponsored about the style we call mid-century modern. It comes to us having been appraised by a committee of Conrans. It is nourishing, it's democratic, it's designed to make the nation's homes look nice and grown-uppish, well-behaved, well brought up, but without any of those tricky complications that happen when people start to express personality in their decorating, heaven forfend. It was a style that came from a catalogue and, of course, still does. The irony is that 
For furniture created to be affordable, Jacobson Alta Tyndall Originals cost more than Chippendale, and quality modern copies bought under their brands won't give you much change from a, well, Caribbean holiday. I suppose mid-century Mogadon is a bit harsh. After all, its plywood heart always was in the right place. But none of us should ever forget it is pasteurised design. All the bacteria, all the cream have been removed. It's a safe style. It's a mass style. And, as Robert Venturi said, less is more is a bore. As someone of taste and refinement, I suggest you subscribe to School of Flock so you get the latest before anybody else does.